Welcome to Comarch Dialogues. In the January, February, and March, April 2021 issues of Comarch, we asked leading architect Robert Benson to interview key individuals about the transformations currently occurring and what we should expect in the future regarding the built environment. For a transcript of this conversation, more interviews from the project, and full digital issues of the Comarch magazine, please visit the Comarch website at www.comarch.com. Ren Habibi is a fashion design student studying at Pratt Institute in Brooklyn, New York. Her passion is sustainable and ethical practices in the fashion industry. She graduated high school in 2020 from Francis W. Parker in Chicago, Illinois, and was editor-in-chief of her yearbook and co-captain of the varsity volleyball team. Thank you for joining us. Let's head into the dialogue. What technology do you expect uh, to impact the most in a post-pandemic society? So um, the tech that I would expect to really be impactful post-pandemic would actually have to be with the Wi-Fi. As a student, I clearly use it all the time. So I think that um, with Wi-Fi, it will give businesses and consumers like more opportunities to take advantage of faster and stronger connections. And again, as a student, I really do hope that Wi-Fi will be more accessible to communities that don't typically have this ability to better their lives and kind of just connect throughout the world. And along with that, I also think businesses will kind of transition into the use of robots or even AI in order to save money on labor because like functioning in the pandemic, it's clear that there are some businesses that have don't like necessarily need humans to work. So I think with that idea, businesses might continue to pursue not having to like actually pay people to work on like do their jobs. And so like how that. does the how does it relate that businesses um, automate, um, you know, much of their business and not pay people? And you're thinking that more people will have, there'll be fewer jobs for people? Or what's the, really, and, and therefore people will need to find another way to make money? Or how do you think yeah. that works? I, yeah, I think so. Because I, I was thinking, like, especially in like factories and things like that, you could really have, if you have like a good system, it could really be automated by robots and I think so people might need to get creative and kind of think of new jobs and ways to like incorporate themselves into the economy if robots start to. So one of the responses could be, um, you know, automated systems don't get COVID. So take the people yeah. out of the situation. So you think there might be a much more influence on on how work is done because these systems won't get sick. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, exactly. on, the, on the Wi-Fi thing, so there's already a 5G movement. You're right. guessing that that's going to be amplified, moved faster, and uh, be put through more because of the needs for broadband. I do. Yes, for mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, I think you highlighted one of the biggest issues right off the bat. There's a huge disparity in access to the internet um, across uh, communities. Um, right. You know, how do we fix that? What are, what are ways, I know, you know, Elon Musk wants to put micro satellites in space so that every surface of the earth is wired potentially, but it's not just the, the broadband uh, is, you know, the west side of Chicago, there's plenty of broadband out there. Um, they just can't afford it or can't afford the device that connects them to it. How do we fix that? Yeah, I'm not, I mean, obviously I'm not like a professional in that, but I really think maybe if people are willing to like educate others and kind of come together and perhaps even again, bringing in like being a student, I'm really into like creativity and things like that. So I really think if people come up with like creative solutions, even using like resourceful materials and kind of building these new, I don't know, types of mechanisms that can like, it doesn't obviously have to be like the speed of 5G, but even at least a little bit of Wi-Fi connection with certain scraps of metal and things like that. I really think if people come together and like build yeah, something new. Like it's a huge, huge issue. Um, yeah, and I, I'm, I'm fully, when I saw the story early in the pandemic of the two girls uh, in the parking lot at a Taco Bell trying to, to grab Wi-Fi uh, uh, mm -hmm. so they could do their schoolwork, if that doesn't get everybody motivated, I don't know what will. Um, yeah, certainly an issue that we need to work through. Anything else on the technology side? Um, no, that's all. I've, <laughs> that's all I've written down for me. Social, you know, so, so, yeah. so social behaviors. Um, you know, yesterday I um, we have a uh, you know pretty small bubble here. We don't go anywhere. We don't do anything. My cousin uh, had just been tested twice plus an antibody test. He was clear, so he came over. Kids love him. He walked in the door. And he put his hand out to shake my hand, and I looked at it for a second, like mm -hmm. 
Um, and I, I ended up shaking it, but then I was like, you know, we're yeah. going to go wash my hands. Uh, what social behaviors do you think change post pandemic? Well, I act, I, I wrote down um, handshaking as one of the things that people are going, definitely going to be like more app apprehensive about and kind of just be like, oh, you know, like oh, I don't, I don't really know where to like go from here, things like that. But I also noticed um, even like pre pandemic, I think customers in like stores and things like that, they would for some reason stand really close to one another, and I, I don't know, I think it was really ridiculous how close people would stand to one another and there just there wasn't really a sense of like a common bubble so i would hopefully think that people would suddenly kind of become self-aware of the personal space and kind of giving themselves distance with one another and also even like the interiors of stores someone could perhaps like design um stores when people go out they will design them in different ways in order to draw draw in more customers, but also make them still like feel safe and kind of not have to wor really worry too much about if like COVID is still here, or any other health concerns and things like that. So, um, so the stores might actually incorporate, uh, new stores coming online might actually incorporate distance measures in their base in the way that they're organized is what you're thinking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so if, effectively the spacing that we're talking about becomes permanent perhaps hmm. or just um maybe not the stores right now but even if people decide to build new stores in the future they could might like incorporate again with tech they might bring in new so you stores. think stores will continue physical brick and mortar i'm not sure because I, I was going to say that i think if the stores they'll kind of adapt in ways to kind of draw in more customers i don't i think that there might be a change uh, in the future in order to draw again more customers and because obviously we're going online there's so many stores that are now functioning online and there people don't really see how convenient it is to like leave their home and not like have to waste all the time and effort or whatever into going into store when they can just have it right at the comfort of their own home with a computer or anything like that so in order to you know draw in customers and bring in the foot traffic, you have to come up with more creative ways to like, get your money's worth and stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead. What else did you have there? Um, I also would, something I would really hope for would be um, if the US adopted a practice similar to East Asia, where no matter, I guess, how small or how even like from a common cold, how small a sickness would be, they would still cover up their face and kind of um you know be mindful towards other people i really think that practice in east asia is honestly really smart and really selfless in a way and i think i don't i don't know if you want to get like too political but i, I don't think masks are political or whatever I, I think it's genuinely for the health and safety and concern of all citizens so i really think the u.s needs to adopt that that social change as well yeah, that's really super interesting. Um, you know, I think the use of masks, um, you know, seemed very odd uh, in this country initially. And um, having been to uh, China and Taipei, Japan myself, um, they're very common. And um, I think I think we're over that hump. I don't understand how it's a political issue. I, for the life of me, I can't understand yeah. it. Um, I, I can't bring my mind to it. Uh, you know, it's <laughs> literally just a medical issue. Um, and trying to stop this terrible thing, and it's just absurd. Uh, but I think you're right. You know, it's a very, very interesting point that even for the common cold, if you have the sniffles or you feel like you've got any kind of symptoms, you should one stay home. But two, if you can't do that, you should you should wear a mask post pandemic, no matter what. And I don't think there should be a stigma anymore. Um, and I and I'm not, you know my hope coming out of this is that we don't have a stigma and that you know that you do. You know that that is part of the norm. That's a really interesting point. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. It, cause I I just think in East Asian culture, people tend to be really selfless and kind of care not just for themselves but for other people. And I think the U.S. It, it'd be best in the U.S. interest to kind of take on that selfless. I read a very disturbing article over the weekend about uh, U.K. Uh, citizens uh, basically having. Uh, pandemic fatigue and not listening to the new, they've had some new restrictions rolled out by the prime minister and they're just blowing it off. And 
not just this country. Um, you know, so yeah. there's some struggles. There's struggles in Germany as well. So I think this thing has really been tough for everybody. Uh, yeah, and I just I wish the U.S. I mean, not just the U.S., but like other countries. Obviously, I know New Zealand. They have such a smaller population, but they've clearly they've followed all the rules and regulations, and they haven't had a COVID case in what months or something. Well, like it's, they're an island, so you know, and they also yeah, prohibited they also prohibited all travel. <laughs> like exactly. no one can so, come to their island. <laughs> exactly. So, but the thing is, the the strict restrictions. I feel like they kind of work i know it makes things really difficult and there's so many aspects but the thing is you do need to you don't have to follow like as intense but you have to at least like be smart and follow like some of what the experts are saying because it's clearly like helping the numbers decrease so i don't know yeah i, I just i just like to make sure everybody's calling out new zealand is an island and they had yeah. very, you know they eliminated all travel so you know that's yeah. uh and now it's now the travel is highly re regulated whereas here we eliminated it. We eliminated some travel, but we were way too slow to do that. And even the Democratic yeah. Party was opposed to it when it was done. So, right. you know, the U.S. is, you know, way off the mark on that one. And it would have went much bigger. So, you know, Europe, Europe, same difference. Everybody's traveling everywhere. It's super hard to do that. Um, mm -hmm. Anything else on social behaviors? It's been great. Um, so far, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what about school? Um, you know, social behaviors in school. I mean, you actually, you're, you haven't gone to Pratt yet physically, um, mm -hmm. but, you know, certainly you've been a student for a really long time. Um, you're apprehensive at an assembly. Uh, are you apprehensive, you know, if you had to go to uh, a lecture, um, if people were seated right next to you? I think, um, I, I think it honestly might depend on the student because some, because we're young, you know, we sometimes, some students, they actually may miss being in like a group of people, you know, and they may kind of find comfort in being like near one another. But then there are other students who will be more apprehensive. And, you know, again, you don't really know if a student's carrying sickness, whatever. So they could be more apprehensive about sitting near someone. So I honestly really think it depends on the student. But I, I definitely see how there will now be like two sides to how students want things. like You know, that. from a majority standpoint, if you were to guess, um, post pandemic, and, and by the way, post pandemic in my mind does not mean that there is no coronavirus. It just gotcha. means that we've achieved some sort of equilibrium. So it could gotcha. be that we're getting a coronavirus vaccine every year. It could be that there's just a certain number of cases that just, you know we're just going to have to move on at some point. Or it could mean that it, you know, that it mutates into a weaker form like the Spanish flu, and then we're just not aware of it. Any one of those is possible. Um, so there is some sort of a new normal, but it's not the same as in 2019. So my mm -hmm. question is concerts and, you know, art shows and, you know, do you see the majority of, you, you know, folks your age interested in doing, going to a concert? Um, I think at least for my generation, I think kids are really excited to kind of get back into the concert and have that type of like atmosphere and vibe. Cause that's something that. I guess every like, you know, every teenager, like in all amongst all generations, I think really enjoyed going to concerts and like kind of, I don't know, there's just like this certain like feeling you get, I think, in your heart and you just get really happy and being Energy. with everyone. Yeah. Enjoy. Yes, exactly. And like watching this like one artist that you really, really enjoy. And I just I think people really miss that. I mean, I'm really I really miss it for sure. So I think, yeah, I think people really are going to. I think you're right. I think you're right. Happy. I think it. I think, and I think that the middle age and the, the older generations are going to look at video of a mosh pit and be just horrified uh, in a new <laughs> way, but uh, that's, that's fine. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I know the, the musicians that I've talked to are just dying to get out and um, oh, yeah. they're, they're tired of playing in their basement. So uh, I get it. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. um, so, and then sort of the last, uh, the question was about, um, markets and typologies, and this is really just more of a thought about um, an economic situation. You know, for instance, just to give you some background, schools are not right. sure how many students are going to apply. You know, there's a lot of kids that would say, I'm not paying for Pratt uh, virtually, um, yeah. I'll defer and I'll wait. And, or, you know, I'm going to do something else for a while. And, you know, college admission was kind of dropping before the pandemic. So, you know, as an institution, as a, as a part of the economy, 
schools are one thing to be thinking about. Um, returning to work in offices, returning to, you know, retail. We talked a little bit about stores or have been, out, you know, absolutely decim decimated. If you drive around right. Chicago right now, you just see one closed yeah. store after another. Um, so what are your thoughts on, on the economy and, and the market? So, um, I actually broke it on, broke it down into a few um, <laughs> awesome. sections. I did, um, I have retail, the arts, education, travel, and entertainment. So wow. should I... Let's go. Them. You you got the floor. Okay. <laughs> cool. So for retail, uh, obviously we just discussed it, but I noticed that the retail market in person has really changed. A lot of shopping has been moved online. So obviously there isn't really that much need to go into real stores. Um, being a fashion student, I'm, I'm genuinely like concerned about the physical experience of going to the store and being able to touch your textiles and see how garments are kind of placed on the store mannequins. And I just... I really wish, I wish that it wasn't kind of going down because I really think that it's a good experience and I don't I, it feels like a more personable experience versus online. Sure, you, you just get your thing, but I think when you get to like see the clothing in person, it's kind of, it's kind of worth it and you, you really do get your money's worth when you know that it's the right fit for you, mm -hmm. you know. And then for the arts, um, I, I was mostly thinking of like museums and performing arts and though that's certainly something that's really hurting like I think everyone's aware of that and um I think there's going to be a need to there's going to be a need for change in that aspect as well so museums and the museums and performing arts they really need to adapt as quickly as possible or else they're going to really have difficulty staying afloat and I'm not 100% sure how they can do that because I know that there's ideas of like virtual galleries and things like that but again at the same time it, you won't be able to see the actual like artwork or performance with your own eyes and I really do think that there's something special about that and again you just get like a certain feeling and kind of just a good feeling in your heart and I it's just it's not the same just viewing it on your computer so I think you know that reminds me years ago the Google art project came out and, and the goal there was to make art uh, famous priceless art accessible to everyone who could get on the internet and so they would do these micro scans of famous, famous paintings, for instance, and then you could zoom in really close and see it and, mm -hmm. you know, add Reinhardt, those black paintings um, uh, that there's one at the Art Institute. You, when you stand there and you get in front of it and you're within three or four feet, um, it dilates your pupils because you're looking at black. And then over time, you start to see crimson and, and purple and some very subtle hues in the black. You can never pick that up on a digital scan. It just doesn't work the same way. And exactly. you're zooming in so close, you can't tell the color shifted. Uh, stuff mm -hmm. like that supports your point about being in person with the art. And um, right now, social media pre-pandemic was already putting, uh, we were viewing art, consuming art on a phone, um, you know, and I wonder how powerful that is. On one hand, I'm really glad that it's out to more people and more people are probably more aware of more art than ever before, but their experience is significantly less because they're not in person. Yeah. So you're saying that the galleries need to adapt. That adaptation is certainly interesting. You know, mm -hmm. how do they do that? Do they push more content to social media and then beg you to, get, you know, go, I mean, how does that work? I wonder. I mean, I mean, I guess that's technically one way <laughs> you could go about it for sure. But, um, I, I don't know if they'd have to like raise prices or kind of reorganize the layouts or something like that. Cause I, again, it, it's gonna be, it's really difficult to kind of reorganize how you're gonna look at a whole gallery or something like that. So. Who's your favorite um, artist right now? Oh, Jesus. <laughs> um, wow, that's a, that's a good question. Um, or favorite piece or, you know, what's, what's really got you, you know, you're really thinking about it. Um, there's, uh, I've always, this is probably basic, but I've, I've loved, I liked Banksy's street work. Uh, there's also someone, uh, I, know, I don't know how to pronounce his name correctly, but it's Jean-Michael Basquiat or something like that. Basquiat, yeah, he died, yeah. Uh, you know, 20 years ago or something, yeah. I think, um, I actually did a, a fashion collection for one of my projects inspired by some of his work, and I, just, I think it's incredible and really. There's a pretty really fun movie about him. Have you seen it? Mm -hmm. Uh, no, I mm -hmm. look it up. It's good. What is it called? 
Oh, um, just no. <laughs> Basquiat, right. you know, just, just Google Basquiat <laughs> film and, and it's a pretty good film and it, it sort of takes you in a little bit behind sort of, and it's a lot about, you know, the, the idea that you're a street person, artist, and then you get all this fame and you're, you know, you're trying to cope with it. I think is a little bit about that. Banksy's Instagram uh, feed, I, he's one of the only people that I have that if he posts something it, it, my phone tells me I have it set to alert me because he doesn't do it very often, but it's been really good. So I'm with you there. That's absolutely true. All right, let's get back to your uh, examination on the economy. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, and then for education, we kind of previously talked about this, but I hope um, being online, the quality of online education would improve because I know that it's still it's it's still brand new if you think about it. It's like it's not even a year old yet. So I really hope that it would improve and kind of uh, I don't know help students with their education because right now it's kind of difficult <laughs> for us to like learn and kind of adapt to because we're not in person and it's there's there's like kind of like a barrier I feel oh, like yeah. between. Oh yeah, I can't imagine trying to do fashion in this situation. Oh, I yeah, my it's it's really <laughs> it's really difficult for sure, but we're pushing through. Um, and also with education, I think I really hope that it would be more accessible. Bringing it back to Wi-Fi being more accessible, I really hope that maybe more lessons will perhaps be like put online for students and young children to at least be able to learn something. You know, I I think I really believe in my heart that education is really important for for everyone no matter who you are or where you come from so i really really hope that at least there's some uh education out there for kids that may not see that as an opportunity when it could be an opportunity mm -hmm. absolutely mm -hmm. and then also for travel that's been a huge uh market that's really been impacted you know um i'm sure people are aware that like airplanes and airports, they aren't like the most <laughs> sanitary places, you know, that you could obviously uh, go to. So thankfully airlines, they've been making more of an effort to be cleaner and uh, the flyers are also more mindful of cleaning their personal space, like prior to sitting down, such as like cleaning their headrest, their tray, table, their seat belts, et cetera. And I also even see like, I, I don't know if this is good or not, but I even see airlines being able to, to like create products uh, in a way to take care of this concern. Like they could like hand out little hand sanitizers or little like disinfecting towelettes or things like that to kind of it can like make the customer feel even more clean and things like that in an unsanitary area. Yeah, and it's also been pretty interesting as terrible as this pandemic is, uh, the dramatic reduction in travel, both airline and vehicular um, has already improved air quality uh, considerably. So For it's sure. a real interesting um, sort of double-edged sword there. And I hope that when, you know, there's a movement to pushing uh, better, cleaner technology for transportation, because as we, you and I talk about the importance of going places, seeing the art in person, seeing different communities, learning from different cultures, we want people to travel. It's an important part of what we do, but we also need to do it in a sustainable manner. And I'm hoping that that is able, we're able to look at this and say, wow, this has been really amazing um, how quickly the air, uh, you know, repaired itself and uh, we need to, we need to not screw it up again. So hopefully we're able to get that worked out. Yeah, I, rem I remember like reading an article about Venice, Italy and how the boats, they would like stop traveling through the canals and then people were like, oh, it turned clear and we can see fish now. And that <laughs> happened and like, they're like, oh, look, there's a swan. And I was like, oh, that hasn't happened in like, what like years and years so it's just it, that made me happy but again you import you emphasize the importance of being able to travel so i think i really hope again maybe maybe answering your like your first question tech would be more eco-friendly and things like that i would hope so so <laughs> yeah um and then for entertainment i mostly focused on streaming i think streaming has i mean it was already a big thing but now it's probably like skyrocketed and i mean i've i've obviously taken advantage of that i I've, i watch a lot of netflix and even like disney plus and things like that i have to admit um so obviously um people they can watch movies now like in the comfort of their own own home without having to go anywhere and 
Um, although that's really nice, again, I really am sad because it will probably take away from the experience of cinemas and, you know, being able to like sit in a movie theater and eat pop. I mean, obviously, you can, I guess you can like eat popcorn at home and things like that. But I just, I just think there's something so special about um, like being there and like watching it on like this huge projector with perhaps people that also share that same interest with you. And I think um, with uh, streaming kind of being able to direct like directly release movies like right to your home you won't be able to uh, have that experience anymore so. yeah um, this has been an issue for going a long time David Lynch uh, famously when DVDs came out was furious because he, he wanted everybody to go to the theater as well um, you couldn't fast forward um, or you could you could pause but you couldn't fast forward or rewind in, in the, there was something in the software because he wanted that control. He wanted you to sit down and watch it in the, you know, one format. And yeah. uh, I remember thinking, you know, no, it's just not how the world works. Mm -hmm. So uh, the cinematic experience, you know, is not nearly as popular as it used to be. And they've tried the pre pandemic to bring alcohol in more comfortable seats. You have to reserve mm -hmm. ahead of time, trying to, trying to do anything they can to keep that experience going. Um, I'm, I'm just as curious as anybody as to whether it will make any sense going forward. I don't know. Yeah, I I, th I mean, we're, we're seeing theaters, unfortunately, close down, you know, over the city, I think. Um, I, I, I just, again, I think this creates room for creativity and people need to think of ways that they can draw in customers and kind of bring a personable experience, I guess, to each, uh, buyer of a ticket and um yeah I, I it's gonna be a difficult industry but or difficult like thing to keep alive but i wish <laughs> there was a way for it. So yeah you know I, I designed um showtime's headquarters in west hollywood a couple of years ago um if you go to the link on my email there's a web address and the password <laughs> is l-u-x-e-t-s-p-a-t-i-o Lux et Spatio, which is Latin for light and, light and space. Um, but that project's on there. And we, HD is really, the camera technology is amazing. So you can see all the makeup on an actor's face. And, you know, when you're watching HD, you know, it's really kind of different than the old school format um, projection film, you know, movies. And I like both. I'm, they're different things. But I, I do like the fact that every single expression in an actor's face is very visible. So they really, really have to be committed to the role because you're really reading all those expressions. And in the design of the Showtime project, we blew their faces, portion of their faces up to be spatial, to be architectural, full size. And the, the space confrontation of being in the presence of such an enlarged photograph was really tremendous and a uh, big part of that project, but it highlighted um, a reality for them. Showtime realizes that you might watch their programming on your phone. You might watch it on your laptop, a tablet, uh, a large monitor. And sometimes if it's social enough, you might actually have people over and project it on a garage door or something. So yeah. they, they realize that the way that you consume the media, they can't control. And I think mm -hmm. the, I mean, I think the reality to that is, um, probably not going to reverse itself. I think what you're talking about probably still happens a little bit 10 years from now. And I think that you might get, oh, wow, isn't it cool to go watch a movie? But it'll be the experience and the novelty of going and seeing that. But then the minute they're in there, people are in the movie, they're on their phone, they're texting, they're, they're not paying any attention to anything for two hours. So where I think it gets interesting is when movies have indeterminate endings. And this is something that's been coming online the last few years. Whereas you might watch a movie, I might watch the same movie, but we have different endings because I interact with the movie and made different choices or had different reactions than you did. And it oh. took a different path. So I think gotcha. that the whole concept might change and could be really interesting. So okay. I, one wonders if, if in, to your point, we get pushed more into the digital realm, that something like what I'm talking about becomes more popular and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, who knows what happens from there. And then if the actors are, you know, think about it this way, if the actors are not actual human beings, but digital simulations, uh, oh. which we see a lot of, now they could make nearly, add the AI that you talked about, they could have nearly infinite 
infinite endings for every movie. Yeah, for sure. That reminds me of the, <laughs> for, sure, for sure. That reminds me of the like Netflix episode, like Black Mirror episode, where it's like Bandersnatch, where you can, or maybe I don't remember if that's the one. Yeah, I thought. Can, like, um, like yeah, go ahead. Sure. Talk about it. But I. That I hadn't done that in like forever, but I, I would just remember there was like this one episode where obviously you'd have to be like really engaged in what you're watching and you'd kind of select the character's path and what they're doing. It's literally going to determine like the whole rest of the plot, basically. So I guess that's a way to like demand the consumers like attention. And, and with that, you know, you think about the popular YouTube channels and you got one of the most popular is this kid who opens up gifts or something and, and other kids watch him oh. open up gifts and I've heard, you know this is one of those things where if you told me oh millions and millions of kids are going to watch this kid open up presents and I'd be like mm -hmm. you got to be kidding me but imagine if you had customized movie cinematic experience where you're just like the Black Mirror you're picking the characters and then you can watch the film that I created by watching it and if I'm let's say I was a famous person and you, everybody would want to know, how did David Lynch, what did he watch? What did he see? Or Ren, the famous fashion designer, what did she watch? And, you know, and I, I think we're getting into, a, you know, this stuff's never existed before. So I think it, that part's kind of exciting. That'd be really interesting to see in the future, for sure. <laughs> Any other thoughts on, on markets or economies? Um, no. Do you think, should I speak on anything else or... Well, any other points on post-endemic adaptability? Any other thoughts you have um, on where you see this going? Um, I mean, I hope it'll end. <laughs> I, I, yeah, as a obviously as a student, I really hope that it'll get better. I, I look forward to having more vaccines released and things like that. And I hope people will, I, I know people are kind of iffy about taking the vaccine, but I really do hope that they'll strongly, strongly consider it, those who are on the fence about taking I think you're going to see, I think you're going to see, um, you know, ideas where, well, you're not getting on an airplane. This is already the case. If you don't have a negative test, you're not getting on an airplane. And mm -hmm. ultimately, for the people that go ahead and get the vaccine, I think there's going to be more opportunities than people who don't. And I think, you know, I'm a little concerned that that's going to create you know, uh, two worlds and, and we'll be doing the Hunger Games, uh, you know, you know, reality show. Um, I don't want to oh, see I, that. I want to see, I want to see us to come together more than be separated. And I think to me, this is, this thing is really bringing this to a head. And um, there's such vast differences between political um, yeah. ideologies. And I'm just hoping that we can strengthen the center and listen to each other a little bit better. Um, me too. And I, I don't know how to do it other than um, reaching out to more people and, and trying to have conversations. But um, I think we'll be we'll be past it. I don't know that we can get done with it in time for you. Uh, and you're, I'm sure you'll be in New York. Go to New York. I think that's a really good idea. Run an apartment and do your online <laughs> classes from there. But my right. guess is the fall you're back in school. Um, you know, preschools, grade schools, they're all doing in-person classes. They've adapted to cohort strategies where it's only, you're only gonna interact with your class. It's not as good as regular school, but it definitely cuts down the rate of infection. And mm -hmm. universities are doing this too. So I think you'll see the ability to do that. I think social distancing and masking up is really working um, in cutting a lot of this down. So I think they will in the fall be able to do that. Um, so spring definitely not, but uh, obviously, yeah, no. but I, I bet the fall, I bet you, you see it. And University of Illinois is doing a really good job, for instance, yeah. of testing yeah. people, um, you know, uh, staff, faculty, students, everybody. And right. I think you'll see a broader rollout of that. So you're, it's going to work out. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, my best friend, she actually goes to Illinois and she gets tested like every like week, once a week, two times a week or something. And they don't even like let you in the building unless you have a negative COVID test, which is so smart. And I really hope more colleges or more colleges, they will adapt it, but they'll get on that a little bit quicker. So yeah. Okay, last word, anything else you have? Um, so far, no, I'm just, I'm very curious to see how the economy will change and adapt for the next five years and even further in that. I'm really curious to see what, even again, being like a design student, I'm really just, interested to see like the more 
like creative aspect, you know, and what other ideas that people will come up with. Because perhaps I know perhaps even kids my age in like five years will be done with college. So maybe some kids even I know might come up with a great idea for post pandemic. So I hope to see that soon. <laughs> Me too. Well, I can't thank you enough for taking the time and, and for being so thoughtful about it and writing it all down. I really appreciate that. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Robert Benson interview series in Comark Dialogues. To stay up to date with Comark content, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on your favorite podcast platform. For more content like this, including a full transcript of this interview, other interviews in the series, digital issues, and more, please visit the Comark website at www.comark.com. Thanks for watching.